Today I welcome David Rottenberg to our HKW talk on the Anthropocene. David Rottenberg is philosopher and musician and he is working at the uh, New Jersey Institute for, of Technology. Welcome David. Thanks so much great, for inviting me here. Great to have you here. Um, the project you are here with uh, is called Unmenschliche Musik in Human Music and it's part of our Anthropocene project. And the ma one major aspect of the Anthropocene project is that human beings inscribe themselves in geological times and by that also redefining themselves, let's say, in their also natural contexts. And one major relationship, of course, is the relationship between human beings and animals. Um, so at a point in your career, you started to become interested in animal music or music of animals. Can you describe how that started? Well, I think it started when I was very young, actually, growing up in a little town outside of New York City, Connecticut, where I, I was interested in music, but also interested in wandering around in the woods and hearing sounds and wondering how these things might connect. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard there were a few musicians doing things like this. And uh, you know, when, when I thought about the possibility, I, I, I thought that uh, it must have already been done. There must have been so much done listening to bird sounds and using them in music. It turned out not so much, really, and, and particularly very little really learning from birds and changing the music that humans were doing. People tended to put nature sounds into their own music. So did you start the interaction on the musical level with, the, with birds, for example, uh, already at a point where you did not reflect, is that music or not music? Or was it already directly part, let's say, of a conceptual approach? I think I started when I was very young, like maybe 16 or 17 years old. It seemed like a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think of where it would go until many years mm -hmm. later when I realized that it hadn't been taken so seriously. Mm -hmm. The idea of live encounter between mm -hmm. human and animal changing mm -hmm. human music into something a little different. And most people doing this kind of thing would put in some nature sounds into their own existing music. Mm -hmm. and and I thought really the live encounter, which led to the most unusual kinds of music, was actually the most interesting because it took you places that you didn't expect. So would you argue that animals produce music or the way we interpret the sounds of animals, we interpret that as music? I think certain kinds of animal sounds are much more like music than they are like language. Mm. And when you start to understand them as music, they become much more approachable. Mm -hmm. For example, bird songs. Many human languages talk about certain sounds of birds as being songs because they are like long performances with a beginning, middle, and end, a shape and a form, a real emotional weight. And the birds are singing them over and over and over again, exactly mm. the same. And. Uh, these performances have to be done correctly or, or they don't serve their function. What, what function do these songs have in the life of the birds? You know, too often the function is explained as the meaning of these songs. Male birds are usually singing to attract females mm. and to defend their territory. Mm. And usually that's the end of the story. And, and biologists have very little to say on why one species of bird needs to sing for hours to do mm. this and another one sings for a few seconds. They don't talk so much about why this is, because it's really a musical difference. It's, it's an aesthetic difference. Mm -hmm. And this is something Charles Darwin talked about in mm -hmm. Descent of Man. He has two whole chapters on birds, and he talks about birds having a natural aesthetic sense. Mm -hmm. They appreciate beauty, and that's why they evolved the need to sing these beautiful songs, sometimes very short, sometimes so, very long. Are all the birds producing music, or are there only a specific kind of no, birds? certain birds produce what I would say is music, because they learn these sounds, and the sounds, the meaning of the sounds cannot be uh, replaced by the, the function. You know, this is the, the philosophical answer, is that mm. birds uh, have to make these performances, and they perform them over and over again. They have to 
fulfill all these aesthetic criteria mm-hmm. to, to serve the function is the same from one species to another. The difference from one to another is aesthetic mm-hmm. and is almost cultural. Different populations learn different things. They learn this different behavior. And uh, the communication is not like a simple message. Birds have calls also. They shout out like, watch out, danger is coming, or I'm hungry, things like this. So those are different. Those are usually <coughs> innate. But the songs, which are more artistic and musical, they are learned rather than something birds are born with the ability to make. Uh, so you would describe the aesthetical aspect of the songs of birds the same way you describe your music from an aesthetical point of view? Well, the difference is, as far as we know, <coughs> that, you know, all the members of one species of bird, you know, the, the, the aesthetic is determined through evolution. They don't, they don't have so much choice, usually. Mm. They're kind of evolved. It's true that the female birds evolve the sense of preference and what the males are going to want to learn how to do. Mm-hmm. And somewhere there's a sense that there's the best song, say for a nightingale, there'll be a best nightingale song. Mm-hmm. We don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. We haven't studied the aesthetic mm-hmm. enough. But the female nightingales know, and the males are trying to figure it out. They're trying yeah. to learn it. So you, you said also that uh, birds really are learning music. Do they learn, let's say, in a lifetime of a bird, and one can really uh, analyze these stages? Well, each species of bird is like a world in itself. And mm-hmm. Each one has a different way of living. And many bird species can only learn during the three first months of their life. That's mm-hmm. called the learning, the sensitive learning period. Mm-hmm. But certain species, like nightingales, canaries, birds with more complex songs, mm-hmm. can keep learning more their whole lives, and they change their songs. They keep working on them. They learn, and each species has a different way in which learning happens. Some species, every year, they start learning again. Mm-hmm. It's as if they've forgotten everything during the winter, and they start again learning one phrase, then more, and then more and more. Other species will learn over many, many years. And they learn on their own logic, or also, let's say, in the interaction with other birds, with other animals, with human beings, Often too? Often the young ones are learning from adult males. Mm-hmm. But in some cases, they sort of improvise on their own. They compose and they mm-hmm. create things that somehow end up sounding the way they're supposed to sound. We don't really know much about this capacity. Other birds are imitating other sounds, and, yes. but they don't just copy other sounds. They compose out of the other sounds in their environment, often from other birds, sometimes other sounds. So you could have the same kind of birds in different, let's say, social cultural context of human beings producing different kind of music? Absolutely, yeah. Birds like mockingbirds and well, in America and lyre birds in Australia. Mm. If, they, if, they, if they grow up surrounded by human sounds, they make different sounds. When you uh, play music uh, in interaction with birds, how would you describe your relationship in this situation with a bird? You become partly bird, and the bird becomes partly a human being in this interaction? Well, it's kind of like using music to communicate <coughs> with another person f- with whom you might not be able to speak. I mm. could sit down with a musician from Japan who doesn't speak mm. English. We could start playing something. We don't know what it means exactly, but we know that musical meaning can happen. Mm. In human music, we don't exactly know how music means so much to us, why it does, what it's actually doing, whether a piece is really happy or sad, wh- how the emotion comes out through the music. So you can sit down with a, a person with whom you cannot speak because they don't share your language and meaningful music can happen. So it's just a little bit of a step to extend that beyond the human species to involve other animals. We don't know what it means. I don't know what it means to the bird. But, but, but do, do you feel an emotional relationship? At least a musical relationship. I don't know if the bird cares when I leave, that I'm leaving. And it depends. You're different species, different individuals. Are different. But what does it do with you? It changes what I think music is. It changes mm-hmm. what, you know, you spend enough time listening to these different musical structures. You appreciate things that first you missed, mm-hmm. you didn't notice were there. And so as a human musician, it changes the kind of music I play, even if the animals are not around. C- can you describe that a little bit, in which way your music got changed by interaction with well, uh, animals? Well, when I went to Australia, and we were playing with lyre birds. The lyre bird has this tail shaped like the Greek lyre. It's peacock-like. It has this elaborate ritual. It performs dancing while it's singing. And this is among the most complex bird songs. It takes them six years to learn to sing. 
and they copy sounds from their environment from other birds, but they really like noisy sounds. Mm -hmm. They don't copy the most pretty sounds. Mm -hmm. They're like, so, and they compose out of these sounds, and you start to hear it. It just sounds crazy at first. Mm -hmm. but the more you listen and you, you hear a bird actually doing this in front of you, and you realize how amazing it is what they're doing, it starts to change what I want to play along with it. And, and, and uh, you imagine this musician here is playing this whole alien kind of thing. You start yeah. to learn how it works. It mm. changes the way I organize my own sounds. And then at first it might have sounded ugly and unfamiliar, and afterwards it sounds beautiful. I mean, it mm -hmm. sounds uh, essential. The bird must keep singing. Mm -hmm. He knows he has to keep doing this. Whether or not anyone is listening, he must do it. Yesterday evening, we uh, listened also to David Cope, uh, who is working with machines, uh, software programs. And uh, at one point, uh, he described his irritation when he started the communication with the machine. Uh, do you have experiences of irritation that you are in a relation, interaction with an animal on, on, a, mu on a music level? Uh, I definitely have a sense of irritation <coughs> in communicating with machines mm -hmm. because you, you, you don't trust these machines. They, they could they start to frustrate you. But <coughs> animals, no, because I don't see why an animal would necessarily want to pay attention to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm always happy if they do. It's more of a sense of wonder and excitement. I'm not irritated if they run away. You know, why, why, why wouldn't they? You know? yes. I, I would say like a lot of people, I would respect animals more than machines. I see. Um, yeah, that would be uh, several questions. Um, we, we spoke basically about birds. What other animals produce music and you have uh, exchanged? Well, one of the most exciting examples is whales, particularly uh -huh. humpback whales, mm -hmm. who have this elaborate song probably the longest song in the animal world. It takes them, uh, they can sing up to 24 hours, mm -hmm. and the whole song is about 20 minutes, and then they repeat it. And it's very organized, like a piece of music. It's very structured. No humans knew about it before the 1950s. Mm -hmm. In general, the public didn't learn until 1970. So this kind of came out of the blue. It really touched mm -hmm. people when it suddenly appeared on the scene. And also, Again, only the males are singing, so we assume it's to <coughs> attract female attention, but no, one, no human has ever seen a female pay mm. attention to these whale songs. Maybe it's for some whole other reason. And the other thing that humpback whales do that other animals do not do is they change their song from year to year altogether. It's like they're all singing a new tune, then they change it to something else, and then something else. We have no idea why. So when you're playing, playing a clarinet, say, along with a whale, a little difficult because I'm standing on a boat. I'm broadcasting my sound underwater. There's an mm -hmm. underwater speaker. I'm listening with headphones to what's happening underwater. Uh -huh. And the whale maybe is performing along together. And a lot of the times the whales will ignore me, but sometimes they really interact and pay attention. That's an amazing moment because you're communicating to an animal in a whole different underwater world. Uh, yeah, how do you experience that? It this relation really that, the, that the yeah. whale is really, to some extent, answering you or responding to you? I think to get, uh, a music is made in between human and whale. Mm -hmm. You really feel the, the, the crossing in a way. Birds are constantly singing. They seem mm -hmm. so accessible. Mm -hmm. With a whale, you feel like you're really touching some mm -hmm. alien world. And since we're so fascinated by these animals with their giant brains, we don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm biggest animals ever to live on Earth. So the idea of making music together with the whale seems like a wonderful possibility, very mysterious mm. and, and surprising. Other animals you have? Well, you're going to hear live working with insects. Mm -hmm. And insects is the most, uh, people have the most disbelief, like what's musical about insects. But I really believe that the rhythmic thrumming of insects and crickets, repeating patterns could be the origin of humans' interest in rhythm and particularly our interest in noise as music, our interest in electronic sounds. I think these insects are so much older than any other animals. Mm. Millions of years on Earth they've been making mm. these sounds, repeating sounds, rhythms, and strange tones, and we cannot, <coughs> excuse me, we, um, we cannot help but be influenced by mm. this when we think mm. of music. And, yes. of, and insects, I think, are a little bit more like machines. They're more likely to simpler organisms respond the way mm. you expect. Mm -hmm. And they, they together, the complexity of insect music 
it's every individual together as part of a large whole. So one is not doing so much different. Is there any research uh, done in which way uh, the influence of human beings on the earth changing, so to say, the, uh, the surface of the bi-urbanization, for example, changes this kind of musician, uh, music of, of, of animals? There's starting to be research on this. I mean, the, the original thing people will say, the scientists would say, is no, of course humans have no effect. These animals have been here so many more millions of years than us. But recently, people have, and scientists have noticed that uh, birds singing in the city are starting to sing louder. Mm -hmm. Nightingales, mockingbirds, <coughs> to sing louder to be heard above the noise yes. in the city. Blue whales, the largest animals on the earth, underwater, they're, they're, the pitch of their sounds is going down. Oh, they have a fairly me. simple song, but the pitches are going lower over yes. time. We don't know why. Is it because the ocean is noisier? Ships yeah. are making noise, human explosions mm. underwater. Mm -hmm. Do the whales have to go lower pitch so their sounds will cover, cover will, their sounds will travel further? We don't know. But mm. we're starting to notice things like this. Other animals, you know, where they are and how many of them there are are changing because of human transformation of the environment. Certain birds are much more common because people have moved them around or because we have more, we've changed the landscape, so yes. it changes what's happening. Yes. And certain individual birds have listened to human sounds and started mm -hmm. to use them mm -hmm. around, the, around, around the world. So, uh, besides being a musician, you are also a philosopher. And yeah. uh, the way you describe uh, the singing, the music of uh, animals, you would attribute creativity to them, I, I assume. And if that is so, what does that mean for your concept, for your notion of human beings? I mean, How that, did that change uh, from the perspective of a philosopher? Well, human beings are animals, certainly. We're a very special kind of animal, reflecting on our world, questioning everything, documenting it. But we are fundamentally animals, and in this Anthropocene vision, we are uh, transforming the world so much that we have to care much more about the world. So in a way, because of what's happened to humanity, we are more dependent <coughs> on nature than mm -hmm. ever before. Yeah. Even though um, we might think sometimes we're distanced from it, actually I think we're not. We're much closer Close. to nature. Yes. We know so much more about it. We know what we have to change our way of living to mm -hmm. make sure we can further ourselves and nature on the planet. So it's ever more important that we, t we communicate more with other inhabitants of this planet. Mm -hmm. and and take their creativity seriously. Mm. And the more we learn about these kinds of things, the more I think science and art could be connected. Mm -hmm. So you also are working in your research and uh, in a, at the university and the research institute, you are working together with natural scientists. Can you describe uh, the way you are working together with na natural scientists? Well, at first when I wrote to this book, Why Birds <coughs> Sing, and I said, uh, the problem with the science of bird song is you, you scientists are not taking it seriously as music. You're counting the syllables. You're saying the bird with the loudest song, with the most notes, has the most mating success. And then you neglect to say it's only in one or two species that works. Mm -hmm. In other species, it doesn't work. Why, what does work? You don't want to ask the question because it gets too much closer to musical analysis. And scientists at first were kind of angry with me. They said, you don't know anything about science. Why are you criticizing us? Typical philosopher. Mm -hmm. But then a few scientists said, you know, you're right. We can look at musical elements in these songs using our statistical scientific methods. Why don't you join us and we'll do some projects? And so I started working, <coughs> started working with this laboratory at Hunter College mm -hmm. in New York with Ofer Chernikovsky. Mm -hmm. So he figured out a way to record every single sound a baby bird makes learning to sing mm -hmm. just by listening to them. And we have computers that can collect all this data and they start analyzing it. Mm -hmm. And this just seemed like an amazing way to, to play around with sound. And mm -hmm. I said, why don't you do the same thing with very long bird songs with single mm -hmm. birds? Mm -hmm. Collect all the data and see what kinds of patterns can mm -hmm. emerge. And they decided to do that. And we're mm -hmm. starting to, to publish work on this where I'm saying one can use a musical approach to analyze bird song. And the scientists are saying, 
okay, we have to quantify it. I said, you can do that, but you're going to be measuring things you didn't think were worth measuring before. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what aspects did you bring in where now the natural scientists are integrating in their work? Well, before, they were just sort of counting number of different syllables. Yes. But that, that was enough. And I said, no, ah, it's okay. not. How do they fit together? Mm. And at what levels of organization are these mm -hmm. songs being put together? And can you, uh, can you identify elements of pattern and structure mm. there? And with, with the, we're working with the two species that previously people would not want to work with. Nightingales, only in Berlin have scientists studied mm -hmm. nightingale song because yes, it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. And then also pied butcher bird songs mm -hmm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. And both of these songs are complicated enough that each individual bird does, does things so different from one mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. that so far we cannot conclude that, that the aesthetics are particularly simple. Mm -hmm. So the scientists are saying, well, we haven't concluded enough here. I'm mm -hmm. saying, no, on the contrary, you've concluded something very important that these songs are so different that they really, we have to consider these singers as individual musicians, mm -hmm. not just a single species mm -hmm. of rules. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. that is significant enough for yeah. science. And yeah, interesting. So you, to some extent, with, let's say your art, art cultural approach, you are changing or starting to change also basic natural science categories. I'd like to do that, yeah. yeah. I also think, you know, in the world of music, everybody studying music should study the music of animals. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, whatever instrument you're studying, you should listen to these things and think about what's musical there or not musical. Like, like mm -hmm. it should be, it's just as in natural science, you want mm -hmm. to study organisms, you, you're starting to cut up frogs or <coughs> nematode worms yes. and you study them in biology class. In mm -hmm. music, you should study the sounds start with insects and birds and whales and, and study the sounds that have evolved through nature and then think about how that leads to human music with all mm. its cultural variation and learn where our culture comes from in terms mm. of listening to sound. And there's so little study of this and mm. it, it can only help the mm. education of composers and musicologists mm. and performers to, to think musically about these things. So one has also really to redefine the cultural and natural categories we uh, had up to now. Yeah, you have to expand the sense of what, what, is, what is culture, sure. what is art, art beauty, yes. and, and not, not get so worried about it and not say we're throwing everything out, out. just expanding and, you know, just as, um, you know, th in, in ethics has expanded over the generations mm -hmm. to include caring about beings who were previously left out. Mm -hmm. The same thing can happen with aesthetics, the same mm. thing can happen with art, and mm. even as the, the world seems more and more human, more and more controlled or shaped by mm. humanity, the whole Anthropocene idea, yes. we have to open up and take nature ever more seriously, yes, and use all the tools we have to relate to the natural world in a wider and more open sense. Since we are also part of nature. Yeah, we can't deny that, we can't just say we do whatever we want we with want, nature. Yes. Thank you very much, David. It was great to have you here and uh, wonderful work you are doing. Thanks, well, thanks a lot. A lot for inviting me.